This video is going to go through uniform circular motion, and there's really a few parts to this. First is introducing what the variables are that we use to describe circular motion. Then we'll talk in particular about uniform circular motion. And then perhaps the biggest chunk of this video sequence will be talking about centripetal acceleration. So there's a lot that we need to do here. And part of this is that it really corresponds to many different learning outcomes. One is how we create representations. Once we see that we're in a circular motion scenario, which might not literally be an object traveling in a circle, like a Ferris wheel, for instance, but maybe it's an object going over a hill, and we would want to use circular motion. So in this case, we actually need to represent that differently. We don't immediately want to go to a XY coordinate system, for instance. We instead want to think about the circular aspect. Uh, communication is a big part here. Again, we're using new variables, and they have very specific definitions. And the units will come in a lot here as well in that we need to be using radians. Uh, finally, problem solving is again really big here in that there's a lot of calculations to do. And a lot of the little equations we learn now that might not seem that hard and that you might not use that often will actually come back a lot when we get to forces and circular motion. So everything that we're doing right now, we're going to learn, we're going to work a little bit with it, and then we're going to put it on hold for a couple of sections, but it will be coming back later as we move into the class and to when, we're, when we deal with forces. So first, I want to talk about effectively position, that before we were talking about linear motion, motion in one or two dimensions, and in two dimensions we just broke it down into two different one-dimensional motion problems, for instance x and y. So then we could talk about position, for instance x. Now there's kind of two different ways to think about position when we have circular motion. So one is angle, and in general angle is going to be our primary dimension that we're working with, the primary object when we're talking about circular or rotational motion. So you know what angles are, and kind of the standard way to define this is again a positive uh, angle is going to be up from the uh, x the x-axis here, so that's pretty typical. So if it's pointed perfectly along the x-axis, that's going to be an angle equal to zero. So that's the standard thing to use, but again, it's always good to have a really clear picture to show me what you're doing. But the second sort of position we could be talking about is actually what's called arc length. Now, what's a little bit confusing here is that this is s and before we were using s in our equations to represent a generalized coordinate either x or y or perpendicular or parallel but it turns out it could work as well for this arc length however the one-dimensional kinematics equations won't work for this which we will talk a little more about later in the videos um, but so what this arc length where we use s to represent it it's really what is the length of this curve, which is the part of, say, a circle, if you can imagine a circle existing here, which is the outside of this angle. So effectively, it's the crust of your pizza slice. So that's what arc length is. Now, in, earlier in a video where I was talking about some trigonometry and angles, I talked about radians, but radians now comes back. So hopefully you feel okay about radians, because really there's this nice relationship between what our angle is, theta, right? So that's our angle, which could be measured in angles or, uh, sorry, in radians or degrees. But if we measure it in terms of radians, we get to take our arc length and we get to divide that by the radius of the circle, which is, of course, either edge of our pizza slice. And you know that this is the radius, r. And that just dividing those two lengths actually will give you your angle in radians. So this is, in a way, how we define radians. And if we just, again, rearrange this equation, we can express our arc length, again the length, this curvy length, of the uh, of whatever part of the circle is subtended as the radius multiplied by the angle, but again the angle must be in radians. 
So don't use these equations if your theta is in degrees. It does not work then. But this is where radians really comes in. So again, two ways of thinking about position, but they're very much related, and this is only true when we're talking about a circle. Obviously, when we were talking about linear motion, we went from position to velocity, and we're going to do the same thing here. Now again, I gave you two slightly different options for talking about position. So we are going to focus initially on the velocity that corresponds to theta, and we call this angular velocity. Now it might look like this is a W, it's not, it's the Greek letter omega, which when I write it, it looks like that. You could also put a loop in it. But so that's the lowercase Greek letter omega. And this is going to be defined just like linear velocity in that we have in, for an average angular velocity, a change in angle over a change in time. So that would give you the average. And if we want an instantaneous angular velocity, it's just the time derivative of angle with respect to time. So again, as time goes on and we see our angle increasing for an object moving from one angle to another, well, you just do the division with time. So hopefully that's fairly clear. Uh, there's a lot of analogies that we make, or at least objects that we refer to. Unfortunately, most of them are a little out of date. So if you imagine, say, a CD spinning or a record spinning, that's going to have an angular velocity. If you dropped a sticker or a bug down on that record that was spinning, we would talk about the angle that it's going through in a given amount of time. So the units for this should be radians per second in general, and there are certain equations we're going to use where it must be in radians per second. But frequently you're going to see revolutions per minute, which gets abbreviated as RPM, the P standing for per, so revolutions per minute. And again, talking about something like records or maybe how fast a wheel is spinning, typically RPM gets used. So be ready any time that you're given an angular velocity in terms of RPM to convert that to radians per second before you do any calculations with it. The last thing to talk about here, specifically with angular velocity, is direction. That your object, say this just big cylinder here, can be rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. So the abbreviations we typically use are CW for clockwise and CCW for counterclockwise. Now, we want to associate a positive or a negative with that. Just as if we're working on the x-axis, we call to the right positive and to the left negative. So similarly, we want to call one rotational direction positive and one rotational direction negative. Now, it might seem a little counterintuitive initially to call clockwise negative. After all, clockwise is how clocks work. But remember that if we have our positive x-hat axis here, that our angle was defined in terms of that. And so this direction, right, going back this way, would be a positive theta direction. And so if we were looking at this wheel turning, and so that our theta was constantly increasing, it would actually be going counterclockwise, reverse of a clock. So that's one way to think about it. There are other relationships here that actually are related to the right-hand rule. So if you've had a physics class in the past where you've maybe learned about the right-hand rule, that is actually still consistent here and that does apply, but we're not going to talk about that right now. So if you haven't heard about that before, that's fine. But if you feel like you know that and you want to know how that relates, it's okay. That still works here. So again, if it's rotating counterclockwise, that would be positive. Clockwise is negative. And this is the sort of thing that it's really helpful to remind yourself by drawing a picture if you need to actually use this in the problem.